Welcome, everyone, to this week's Coffee Talk with the Doc. If you're joining me live here or watching the replay, I'd love for you to drop in the comments where you are joining me from on this beautiful Friday morning or whatever day it is when you watch this replay of our Coffee Talk with the Doc. If you are new here, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. I'm Dr. Katie Woodley, founder and integrative holistic veterinarian of The Natural Pet Doctor, where we help pet parents like yourselves find and heal the root cause of frustrating pet gut health issues. They are no fun. They can be really hard to uncover. Why is my pet still itchy? Getting ear infections, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, all sorts of things can manifest as an underlying gut health immune issue, emotional health problem, detox problem. And that's why today we are doing a live Q&A because we get questions every day from amazing pet parents like yourself from all over the world. And there's a reason why. My favorite question to always ask is why is this happening? Why are we using something? And it's not always necessarily about giving more, but it's asking the question, why would I give this? Why is that symptom there? Why can't I figure this out? And that's probably why you're here. So, hey, Catherine, I see you all the way from Dubai. Welcome. Hey, Angela, great to see you. So we've got a lot of questions that were submitted through our newsletter. If you are not on our weekly newsletter, make sure you head to the naturalpetdoctor.com and join our weekly newsletter so that you can get First dibs on things like these, additional help and support and guidance and resources to help you figure out why your dog or cat may not be improving with their gut health problems or symptoms like allergies. But we have a lot of questions submitted. So what we're going to do is it's going to be a fire round where we're going to post the questions. I'm going to go through how I would work through that if you were my client, give you some tips and resources that can help guide you on this path. And we're going to go through as many questions as we can. So, Ryan, if you could bring up that first question from our fellow pet parents, let's get started with answering some of these questions that are really important and might actually be related to what you're going through with your pets. So what we will do is, so first question from Lauren, what are the signs of leaky gut for a cat and a dog? So leaky gut, it's a term that's come up for a lot of pet parents. Recently, it's been around on the human side of medicine. And this is really important. And it's a commonly missed issue because it doesn't always relate to symptoms that are necessarily what they seem like from the gut. And when we talk about leaky gut, we need to talk about, well, what exactly does that mean first? So when we look at the gut, the gut is quite long, right? And it extends all the way from the mouth, all the way to the rectal area. So we have the oral cavity, we have the throat, the esophagus, we have the stomach, we have the small intestine, we have the large intestine, the colon, the rectum. So there's a lot of factors that can play a part. When we're referring to a leaky gut problem, this is where essentially that means that that gut lining is hyperpermeable, meaning things can pass through it from the interior, the inside of that gut, that shouldn't be passing through. That gut should be nice and tight. It's held together with tight junctions. It's only one cell layer thick. So it's really important that we maintain that integrity of the gut lining. And so when we start seeing things like leaky gut or we're worried about it, symptoms that you might notice in your dog and your cat can include things like vomiting, food sensitivities, diarrhea, loose stool, gassiness, ear infections, anal gland problems, licking and chewing the paws excessively, hot spots, itchiness, behavior problems also, because there's a lot of interconnections with that gut to the rest of the body. So I mentioned it's not always very clear for a lot of pet parents and even veterinary colleagues that like a skin issue is actually potentially due to a leaky gut problem. So what ends up happening if we are trying to treat allergies and we're only treating the symptom of itchiness with things like Apoquel or Cytopoint injections, that we end up missing why and healing 
the actual terrain of the entire gut, the microbiome, the gut lining, calming down the immune system that led to the symptom you're seeing in your pet. And you stay on that vicious cycle of trying all these different things and it's not working. So it's really important to identify if we are dealing with a leaky gut problem. So if you heard me go through that list of symptoms, don't worry, you can watch a replay. If you're like, whoa, what was that again? So a lot of symptoms that we see with our pets ranging from behavior, reactivity, anxiety, to skin issues and allergies, to anal glands, to of course gut health issues can actually be related to a leaky gut problem. Now we've done a previous coffee talk with the doc is leaky gut, why your pet is sick if you wanna dive deeper into leaky gut. So I recommend going to that resource. We just dropped that video link in the comment section. So you'll see it here. You don't have to bring it up on the screen, Ryan, because they'll be able to click through on those links. The other thing too is if you're like me, I love knowing what I'm treating. And we have so many great functional medicine tests available now. And we actually have a stool test that so many pet parents can order that from Innovative Pet Lab. So my colleagues at Innovative Pet Lab, we've done a lot of uh, talks with them and educational content with them. You can actually order a stool test kit to see, does my pet actually have leaky gut? And there's certain types of markers that we will see in the gut that will show us, are those tight junctions separating because of inflammation in that gut lining? And now we're producing specific markers or proteins like zonulin that shouldn't be there. Do we have elevated levels of inflammation? So calprotectin can show us that. And that can give you an idea of, whoa, I really need to get on top of this. And then also what's really nice with the testing is not only do you know, yes, we do have leaky gut. Yes, we do have inflammation. Yes, that immune system, that secretory IgA is either overreactive or underreactive. So now we know, but when you add in certain supplements or you change the diet, who here, drop a one in the comment section if you've been like, I'm using all the supplements, I have no idea if they're working. I don't know if I should stay on them. And all of a sudden we have a cabinet full of supplements and you're like spending a lot of money and you're like, I don't know if I should keep giving these. Anyone else experiencing that where you're just like confused, how long do I do this? Debbie, I see you drop that one. You're not alone. Nosley, I see you. Thank you guys. I love that you're here live. It's super common. And so this is where also functional medicine testing, when you're using these supplements, the goal is to heal that leaky gut, that hyperpermeable gut lining. So when we retest, so say after like three months, depending on how long your pet's been sick, right? They didn't get sick overnight. It takes time to heal the gut. It takes time to calm down an overreactive immune system. And each pet is an individual with the different factors that are going to either reduce or remove the resistance to healing or put more layers and resistance to healing too. So sometimes that journey takes a bit longer and we need to use supplements longer. But this is where you can retest with innovative pet lab tests and you can see, are these markers decreasing? And this is also where too, we get our clients and our blueprint program to a great healthy baseline where there are no symptoms. And we can use this test to check in with their pet's body and see, hey, they're still doing good. We're, we're still good not to add in that colostrum. We're still good with just like the food therapy and the current herbs that we're using. Or we see, uh-oh, that secretory IgA kind of dropped a bit again, we need to support that immune system. So then we can add in certain things like medicinal mushrooms or colostrum to give that pet a little bit of a boost because maybe their immune system doesn't work as well as we really want it to. And we have a lot of great functional tools like food therapy, uh, using food as medicine, using medicinal mushrooms or things like that, that will help support them. So they don't end up getting their buckets too full overflowing. And then that's when we see symptoms. So those tests are really helpful. 
I go a lot more in depth too in our free masterclass, the Better Gut Health Masterclass. So anyone here can watch that and understand those different pillars that could be creating more strain or resistance to your pet healing that actual gut health issue. So definitely check out that Better Gut Health Masterclass. You'll see there's a Better Gut Health program if you really want to go take a deep dive and understand those tests at a deeper level, have those frameworks and tools to better understand also. So those links are in the description below. You can definitely check them out. They're also on our YouTube page, which a lot of you are on, Dr. Katie Woodley, the natural pet doctor. All right, that's leaky gut. Let's go to the next question from Christine. So give it a second. We'll bring that up on the screen. Perfect. Thank you. So this is a question about dogs digesting raw veggies like broccoli or veggies that might have lectins or oxalic acid. Can they be a problem if I put them in a homemade raw blend? Perfect. Okay. So this is where who here is using like vegetables in their pet's food. So give me a, let's do a three on this Friday morning. If you are using vegetables, you're adding them into your pet's food, uh, whether it's a dog or a cat. Some people are adding also a little bit of like fermented greens into their cat's food or fermented uh, other products. Thank you, Denise. I see you, Debbie. I see you. Thank you for commenting. So adding vegetables in, now, here's the thing. Dogs are what we call facultative carnivores. They, they do have a little bit of omnivorous properties like humans, but when you look at their dental structure, they are not humans. So they are not made to digest and they actually have zero requirement for carbohydrates in their diet. Now, the reason why I recommend using and adding in things like greens and these vegetables that they're high in phytonutrients. So they're adding additional antioxidants, additional nutrients to help support the body. And with the way the soils are depleted with our toxin filled world, our pets bodies and our bodies are working a lot harder. So we want to give them as much support as possible. But because our dogs are not made the way that we are, they don't have as many of the broad variety of digestive enzymes that we currently have. So there's a couple ways that we can help support them when we are adding in these beautiful greens that we should be also adding in for our own diets. Hopefully you're getting a lot of good nutritious vegetables and fruits and uh, greens into your diet too. The thing is we need to help them break it down. So there's a couple different ways to do this. As we know, as dogs age and same with cats, they start decreasing the amount of digestive enzymes that they produce. And if you have a dog or a cat, I know this question is specific to dogs, but cats also apply to this situation too. If you have a dog or a cat that is experienced or like continuously experiences pancreatitis, where we have a lot of inflammation in that pancreas, that is also going to put a strain on the amount of digestive enzymes that are being produced from the pancreas to then break down the food into absorbable nutrients, amino acids, vitamins, minerals, that then are also supporting the microbiome, which is all those beautiful trillions of different types of microorganisms that are going to make other postbiotics, hormones, nutrients that are going to support the rest of the body too. So it all plays a part, right? Everything is interconnected. We need to break down that food. Another impairing factor for a lot of dogs and cats also is that their stomach environment is not optimized where they have, they don't have enough stomach acid, that pH is not low enough to activate certain enzymes, like things like pepsin, or activate the pancreas to produce all those digestive enzymes to break down the food as it passes through into the small intestine. This can set us up for food sensitivities, allergy issues, because if the food's not being broken down, for one, it can lead to a lot of gas. So if you have a really gassy pet or a burpy pet, um, and they're constantly like burping, and you're like, why are they burping so much? Not normal. Like burps every now and then is fine. We need to get things out, right? If we have a little bit of stagnation. But we need to make sure we're breaking down that food so it's not getting intact 
to the large intestine. And all of a sudden it creates a stressed state for the microbiome, which then can lead to leaky gut, which we talked about. That can overstimulate the immune system because now the immune system seeing these whole protein particles and it's like, what is that? And it starts overreacting, it's working harder. And that's when we see inflammation and things like skin issues or the gut brain access, the brain on fire issue. So this is why it's really important to support them. So there's a couple of ways to do this, especially with older pets. This is where I love using digestive enzymes and I see amazing results with digestive enzymes to help our pets process the food a bit better. There is a product called Standard Process NZ Core. And also I use it a lot of times with Zypan, but NZ Core is a great product to add in when we are using these vegetables because it's actually a human product. So it's going to provide more plant-based digestive enzymes to help break down the vegetable content so your pet can absorb it and have it do why all the things we want it to do, which is why we're feeding it. It also has L-glutamine in it, which is a really important amino acid that is going to support the gut lining so we don't end up with leaky gut conditions. So to make those tight junctions stronger and healthier. So that's a great product to use. You can check it out in the link in the description. I use it all the time. Um, I use it for myself too, because we are the same for as our pets where our digestive enzymes decrease. The other key component here too is how else can we help break down the vegetables and things like that? This is where I do not recommend feeding them raw things like broccoli or carrots. And this is why a lot of times you see them poop it out, right? You're like, I gave them a carrot and they're pooping out carrot chunks. Here's the newsflash. They're not absorbing it. We just wasted the organic carrot on your pet's gut, right? Because we need to help them break it down. There's a couple different ways to do this. We can blend it up. So we're macerating it to make it easier to help break it down. It's already partially broken down, but also to steaming these vegetables is really helpful. Or using things like fermented green juju products. Uh, Gussie Guts is another product too that we recommend and love using with our clients also. So it's already essentially started that that fermentation process makes it more easily absorbable. You can ferment your own veggies or you can steam them, blend it up in a blender, and then you can always do a batch of it and freeze it and then thaw it. If you're like me, where you like to prep things and where it, you know, it helps time-wise. So those are a couple options, digestive enzymes, making sure that we are steaming and blending up those vegetables to make it easier for our pet's to digest. Really, really important. And in terms of dosages, because the NZ Core is a human product, this is where if you have really sensitive pets, we start with low doses, sprinkles, working your way up. But if you typically have a pet less than about 20 pounds or so, start with a half a capsule um, per day. Um, so you could always split that into a quarter or a sprinkle of that capsule. Um, twice a day, if you're feeding twice a day with each meal. And then you would typically do about a full capsule, um, 21 to 50 pounds, over 50 pounds. This is where I'd probably do a capsule twice a day. So I hope that helps. All right, let's move on to the next question. Okay. Okay. So we have a long question from Cindy. So I'm trying to work on improving my seven-year-old dog's gut health. So this kind of relates back to, I was just talking about digestive enzymes, right? It's a key thing. We have an older dog. We're going to have some issues. She's been on raw food, but had digestive problems with raw. I now cook her meat, blanch steam veggies for her meals, which are rotation pork, turkey, and beef. The intolerance tests all show something different. She's not responding to novel diets, is still getting hot spots. I need help on a diet for her. What can I do to help her? She feels miserable. Can anyone here relate to Cindy? Give me a two if you can relate with digestive issues. You've tried some testing. It's more confusing. Then you tried a raw food diet, but your pet got worse on it. And you're like, what the heck do I do, right? Drop a two if that sounds like you. Deb, I see you. Not a fun situation. Nosley, I see you. Not a fun situation. Debbie, I see you. You are my people. It's not fun. Not fun at all. So here's the thing. This is where we have to take a step back. I find that a lot of times 
we end up missing the forest for the trees because we focus on just diet. Now, diet is a foundation, but it is not the only foundation. I hear all the time, like, food is the only thing that matters. Get them on a, you know, fresh food diet and it will fix everything. Lies. It can help. And I highly recommend that. And it can create resistance. If you aren't feeding a more minimally processed diet, it will make your life harder. But here's the thing. I usually end up working with pet parents who have done the food thing and their pets are not improving. So if food was the only thing that mattered and they were feeding a balanced diet, they were feeding, they were doing it right. Now there's, we can do it wrong where we're only feeding meat and vegetables and we're not adding in organs. We're not adding in the calcium source. We're going to create issues long-term and you're probably going to create symptoms that actually aren't an allergy or a skin issue or a gut problem, but it's actually a nutritional deficiency. So keep that in mind. But I work with pet parents every single day that are doing it right, but their pets aren't responding. Here's the thing. Your pet may not do well on a raw food diet. We talk about minimally processed. Minimally processed foods do not always mean that you have to feed a raw food diet. It can work well for a lot of pets, but with an older pet, energetically from a food therapy perspective from Chinese medicine, the spleen, which is digestion, does not like to be cold. And that digestive power as our pets age for both dogs and cats decreases. Raw food is actually harder to digest. It is cooler energetically. And that might trigger a few people hearing that, but I'm going to repeat it for all the people in the back. Raw food is more cooling energetically and can potentially put more strain on the digestive system for pets who are sensitive, older, it just might not work. So with those pets, I usually don't do a raw food diet. And this is where exactly like Cindy started cooking the meat, which is going to actually warm it energetically and help. So it's also going to help break it down a little bit more. So it's like pre-digesting it and it can make a huge difference. Now, here's the thing that can be frustrating. Tests are helpful, but they don't, they give us pieces to the puzzle. They don't necessarily give us all the information. And sometimes they give us information that doesn't make sense. So Cindy mentioned doing three different intolerance tests. So she probably did some bioresonance tests. There's like Glacier Peak, five strands. NutriScan is the one I typically will go to if we want to go down that path. And then her holistic vet put her dog on a novel protein. And this is part of the elimination diet trial. We talk about this in our Better Gut Health Masterclass and also in our Better Gut Health program and in our Blueprint program, which is really important. Because an elimination diet trial, if you can't afford all the tests, that is your go-to and it can work really well. And we want to do that to make sure that there's not a food sensitivity. So we want to use a protein that that pet hasn't been exposed to. Now, here's the thing. And this is where Cindy stuck is that she did that and she did it for eight weeks, but her dog was still having issues with licking the skin, the legs, the anal gland issues, hot spots, that type of thing, or no anal gland issues. Anal glands were fine, but she was licking her back end. She tried other foods. And here's the thing. We're missing a big piece to this puzzle, right? It's not just about the food. It's about the ecosystem and all the interconnections that also have to be healed in order for this dog to start healing. So yes, using a minimally processed diet is key. The other thing too that I love starting with to get a better idea of where your pet's at at a cellular health level for the past three months is hair tissue mineral analysis testing. So we've done a previous coffee talk on this also on hair tissue mineral analysis test, what it is, what it shows us, but it can tell us, are we vitamin mineral deficient? Do we have a copper excess, which actually can mimic allergy? So this may not actually be an allergy issue. We're just assuming it is because of the symptom of licking. But have we checked the microbiome? Do we have a dysbiosis or an overgrowth of bad bacteria? Are we lacking diversity? Do we have a leaky gut? Probably. 
that's not being addressed because we need to provide nutrients to help heal that gut lining. So calm down the inflammation. So this is where nutraceuticals like slippery elm are very soothing. They act like the Band-Aid on an inflamed gut. Also too, that L-glutamine that I mentioned previously is also going to support the healing of that gut lining. And it's a food so source for those enterocytes, those gut cells. Also too, are we lacking or have an overreaction of the secretory IgA? So that's the important part of the local gut immune system that's going to bind to and trap toxins, parasites, help remove things so it doesn't get to the immune system and the whole body and cause this reaction that's then manifesting as a skin issue. So we have to look at the whole ecosystem. And this is the number one thing that's missed with pet parents and maybe yourself where you're stuck. We have to heal the ecosystem. We have to remove stress also, but also too, that hair tissue mineral analysis test is going to show us, do we have heavy metals? One of the recent members that came into our community a couple months ago into the blueprint program that we offer where I work close on one is that we did a hair tissue mineral analysis test. This dog had recurring ear infections, itchiness. I have never seen so many heavy metals appear. I was like, holy smokes, we have an inflammatory problem because of a detox heavy metal issue that is manifesting as a skin or allergy issue. This is why Apoquel and Cytopoint and all the antibiotics and all the like immunosuppressants did not work because they were treating the wrong thing. They weren't treating the thing that the pet actually has, but we were creating another layer of resistance so this pet couldn't heal. So if you're like, holy, oh my God, that's me. Like schedule a call, schedule a call to learn more about how we work with pet parents like yourself. It's a free discovery call to see if we can help. I don't know if I can. That's why we do free calls to make sure it's a fit. And we're, we take about 10 pet parents each month in our program and that's it because we work closely with you and our amazing community to find those root causes and heal them because there's a lot of factors that can mimic what we assume are allergies or food sensitivities and are a massive issue for keeping you stuck because you haven't found the true root cause or causes and started healing it the proper way. So there's a link there to schedule a call. You can also reach out to us, send a DM, send us a message, comment under our videos or send an email to us also. We're more than happy to share, um, but jump on a call. You have nothing to lose. It's free. So if you're stuck with your gut frustrating gut health or allergy issue, um, thank you, Nosley. Dr. Katie's programs are very informative. Nosley's been with me forever. She's amazing, her and Pookie. Thank you, Nosley. All right, let's jump to the next question. All right, we'll drop that up there. All right, so Elmo has stomach growling in the mornings sometimes and makes him disinterested in food. Do you have any recommendations for the days when his stomach is grumbling and does not eat? I know that one. It only allows us to put a certain thing in. So, all right. Who here? Drop a five. If your pet also gets what we call this borborygmus, that gurgly, the noise where you're like, whoa, what's going on there? And then they're like not eating. You might also see some like excessive lip licking, kind of where they stick their neck out and they're just like, and it can occur before eating, it can occur after, and you're like, they just don't seem like they feel good. Yes, Teresa, I see you. Oh, Shabhangi, you're here. Awesome. That is your question with Elmo. So this is where, now I don't have the full context, so keep that in mind for all of these questions. There's all these deeper layers and levels and questions that I would want to know. But when I hear that, and I hear also that now we're seeing a disinterest in food, my concern would be, are we experiencing what's called gastritis or inflammation in that stomach lining or even things like acid reflux? So first off, we need to know what's going on at the gut level. So if you haven't done an animal biome microbiome test, that's a great starting place 
One of the key missing things that happens with a lot of pets with gastritis or acid reflux is they actually have an overgrowth of pathogenic E. coli that's creating that acid reflux. And we have to resolve that. Now, here's the thing. I don't want you to view parasites and like pathogens as things that we have to take out and kill and obliterate, right? We need to look at why is that pathogenic bacteria there? And that comes down to the ecosystem. That ecosystem is in a setting and a state where it's allowing the pathogenic bacteria to overgrow. So we need to also heal that environment. So a lot of times with stomach growling and like the irritation, this is where things like your slippery elm or marshmallow root, which are your, your soothing mucilages can help. I also use digestive enzymes because maybe this pet isn't breaking down and digesting the food appropriately. So I'd mentioned like the NZ Core product previously. This is also where Zypan, the standard process Zypan can be really helpful or even the standard process canine or feline enteric support. I like standard process because they use whole foods and glandulars to really give the body the nutrients it needs with less synthetic vitamins and minerals, right? We don't want a lot of synthetic vitamins and minerals. The other big thing too is I don't know the diet that's being fed. So are we on a more highly processed, ultra processed food like kibble that's going to be using synthetic vitamins and minerals that is going to be at least 50 to 60% carbohydrate content? It will be a high carb diet. It has to be. And because that's, it has to have the carbs in order to be extruded in the process of making kibble. That's just the reality. And then it's baked or it's not baked. It's cooked, like obliterated at high heat temperatures multiple times. And a lot of times these kibble diets are using poor quality ingredients. They're using rendered products. We talk about this in our programs. A lot of people, and even myself years ago, I didn't under truly understand how pet food was made. So these would definitely be things that I'd be looking at. Like the food, when we have this, if we are feeding an ultra processed food, I would do a slow transition to a more minimally processed diet. We have a free guide, a simple guide to improving your pet's food on our website, thenaturalpetdoctor.com that you can download with a lot of other resources, how to transition. And then of course, the brands that we recommend with different types of categories of food. If you can't go straight to a like lightly cooked or a fresh food or even a potential raw diet, I see a oh, perfect, you dropped I am dry food. Number one, I'd be transitioning to a different food if you can. Um, definitely to check out our blog post, the tips for sensitive dogs. We will drop that link in the comment section. So definitely click on that. It's on our website, the natural but I go through the things that we need to remove, how to replace and how to soothe and start healing that ecosystem because we need to follow certain steps and frameworks that we teach in our better gut health program. And also in our blueprint program or else we won't heal that gut. And a lot of times pet parents try to transition. They're doing the best that they have the best intentions in the world to change the diet. But then they end up with diarrhea because we had these imbalances present and our pets were sensitive. So you always want to go slow. Yes, some people can jump straight, like straight over. Healthy pets that have zero symptoms or seem healthy and strong. Those are the ones that I'm like, great transition or, you know, with my own cats right now, like I will change brands, protein sources daily. Um, I pull out a new food. I use a raw food diet for my cats because they're able to handle it, tolerate it and do well with it. I will change brands. I have like, I don't know, we have a lot of foods in our house, different brands. We probably have six or seven different brands. I have a, like three, I think three different types of raw food diets that we rotate and I rotate all the time because I know their guts for the most part can handle it. If I see any increase in like vomiting or GI upset, I wouldn't change around that much. And I would focus on what do we, what do they need? What are they missing? Is this emotional health issue that I need to address too? So this is where journals are really helpful also to see trends because our pets, are very connected to us, which is awesome, right? It's so cool. However, if we're going through a lot of stress or experiencing stress, or there's a lot of changes that we can't always control, that's something to be aware of. 
because your pet may be responding with a gut issue, right? Who here gets like butterflies in your stomach? You get excited, right? That's a gut reaction because of that gut brain connection. And so we need to, and also vice versa, we go through a trauma or a stressful process. Like we need to feel those emotions. It's important to feel them and then release them. And if we're not properly handling those emotions, our pets will feel it also. So it's a great way for the entire family to get better emotionally resilient, but we don't know if we're not tracking that or if we're not aware of it. And that could be the issue. So for number one, I'd start with food. Number two, I'd be looking at the other factors that can impact gut health and digestion and keep a journal to see if there's certain trends that are occurring. So I hope that helps you. All right, next question. Okay, so from Pamela, my five-year-old German short-haired pointer seems very healthy, great appetite, consistent stools, rarely vomits, but she's tightly wound up and struggles with her self-control. After watching the Gut Summit, fantastic. I wonder about heavy metal toxicity. Can you recommend a test for this? I certainly can. Other possible causes for her anxiety. This totally could be a heavy metal issue. It could also be a gut imbalance because the gut-brain access is a very strong influence. So one of the biggest nerves and longest nerves in our body is the vagus nerve, and it connects our brain all the way down to our gut with different innervations along the way with different organ systems. And so this is why stress, we feel stress, can directly cause leaky gut. Leaky gut can cause brain on fire and neuroinflammation. So we have this cycle, this bi-directional component back and forth that we need to be aware of. This is where making sure it's not a heavy metal issue or a detox problem that's like increasing resistance and inflammation that's going to increase the resistance to healing is really important. Some pets are just born with slow detox pathways, just like humans. And we need to make sure that we're opening up those pathways appropriately, depending on your pet's toxic level. This is where we do those hair tissue mineral analysis tests to get a better idea. I create the reports myself and provide supplement and nutrient recommendations based on what's happening with your pet internally. Those hair tissue tests are one of the only ones that will actually test for heavy metals and give us a level for them. They're really, really helpful, very powerful, and can get you on the right path and the blueprint for starting to heal. There's also, we have a free anxiety guide so it's another PDF download for anyone here for dogs and cats with other supplements and recommendations and tools to help your pet. So you can download that. We just drop the link in our Facebook and our YouTube comments. So I hope that helps, Pamela. I'd start there. The testing can be really powerful and helpful to make sure you're treating the right thing. And that behavior training is also really helpful too. Uh, your environmental or sorry, your, yeah, your environmental, like emotional health, environmental enrichment. Um, keeping them busy, getting that energy out. This is a high energy breed, giving them the, the tools and the tasks that are going to help them meet their needs is also really important. All right, let's jump to the next question. Okay, so this is another longer question, Carolyn. Okay, so my cat's been diagnosed with gastritis, thickening of the stomach lining. I was given prednisolone to put him on. I've been rebelling, not put him on it, trying to get him onto a raw diet using marshmallow root to soothe his tummy. Is there a treatment that's natural for gastritis? Is gastritis and IBD the same thing? I've been weaning him off the poor quality food, switching to healthier food choices with my ultimate goal is a raw diet. What is the best diet for this? Okay, so this is where we've talked about gastritis. So usually we're gonna be seeing things like vomiting. We're gonna be seeing things like, um, acid reflux is also another symptom of gas. Keep in mind when I say gastritis, any itises are a symptom. I hear all the time, oh, I was diagnosed with colitis. Great. That just means your colon's inflamed. Why is it inflamed? Can I get like, like an amen in the comment section with that? When I realized I was doing that to clients years ago, where I was like, oh, you have colitis. But I wasn't asking why. It's a very different question that leads you to a very different response and treatment. Because when we start asking, well, why does my cat have gastritis? Is there something that's causing that? That's really, really important. 
So same with IBD. Inflammatory bowel disease is where I kickstarted this whole path 10 years ago with my husband and his diagnosis of IBD. Take strong immunosuppressants, food doesn't matter. Straight words out of our gastroenteral multiple gastroenterologist mouths on the human side. I was like, what? That doesn't make sense. Why did the body decide to start attacking itself? It's not like we just wake up one day and we're just like, a bomb goes off and our body's like, nope, we're done. We're just going to start like attacking it. There's always a reason. There are triggers that then set the immune system into the state that's going to create that condition. So this is an end state where we have now enough inflammation to, from the conventional medicine side, diagnose something, right? But it doesn't tell you why or how your pet got there. So this is where I mentioned with gastritis for both dogs and cats, we can have overgrowth of pathogenic bacteria, things like E. coli. This is where doing a microbiome test would be really important to give you a better idea. Uh, helicobacter infections is really common, uh, really hard to diagnose unless you're doing a biopsy, not necessary, but I'd be thinking about what is that environment? What do we need to support the ecosystem? Why is that ecosystem unhappy? That inflammation is continuing to occur. We need digestive enzymes usually. We need the proper food. The raw food might be too cooling at this stage. Now, I love that Carolyn's using marshmallow root. Fantastic. That's great. Also, too, using foods that are going to be nice chi tonics, spleen chi tonics also can be really soothing and helpful, too. This is where congees. Um, short term cats, we have to be a little bit careful with, but dogs with gastritis, congees from Chinese medicine, they're cooked for a really long time, slowly cooked at low temperatures, make it more easy to digest. There's a lot of great free resources. So that can be a support for the short term when you're in a acute flare up stage. Um, but I'd be looking at how do we heal this? So marshmallow, slippery elm are going to help our digestive enzymes making sure we don't have a dysbiosis or overgrowth of pathogenic bacteria. Certain types of pa pathogenic bacteria like E. coli, there's some great options. Pre-4 Pro is a bacteriophage that actually attacks the E. coli to bring down those levels without impacting the rest of the microbiome, which is really important. This is also where I use things that are going to help heal that leaky gut too. Um, there's different brands and products out there. Thorn has some brands that do that. RX Vitamins has some brands for really sensitive pets. A lot of times I'm using hypoallergenic human products at lower dosages and working them up. That's why that's how I work with pet parents in our blueprint program to make sure that we're slowly introducing these things for those pets. So this is where a lightly cooked food would probably be better tolerated at this point. While we're reducing and healing inflammation, testing would be helpful also to make sure that we are helping them. Uh, I just saw a question from Catherine, cats with stomatitis, it's usually a gut health issue also and an immune system issue. We talked a little bit about that last week in our weekly coffee talk with the doc. The oral microbiome and the gut microbiome connection is really important. But there's a lot of things that we can do to use. I've worked with a lot of cats with stomatitis. It's a very frustrating, hard condition and usually ends up with a lot of cats losing all their teeth, but there's ways to support them and to help them. If you are frustrated and stuck, once again, just book a free discovery call to learn more about some of our programs we have and see if it's a fit. I don't know if it is, but I work with pet parents closely in our blueprint program to help them. So you can always schedule, schedule a call to see if that's helpful for you. And if it's not, I'll provide some other resources that might be a better solution or help for where you're currently at. All right. So let's go to the last question we will take to round out this week's live Q&A session for this week's Coffee Talk. Um, I know this next question is a common one that I see all the time that scares a lot of people. And I think it might be one that might be helpful for other people too. Okay, so let's go to, um, okay, I think I jumped around. Jan, all right. My nine-year-old cat has been on prescription food for seven years and atopica, which is an immunosuppressant. So that's cyclosporin until a couple of years ago because she licked her fur off of some areas due to some kind of allergy. CSU couldn't figure out what she was allergic to. Interesting. 
maybe she doesn't have allergies. Just a small thought. Uh, she's been fine since, but I'd love to get her onto real food. But I'm afraid of triggering allergies again. Suggestions. Okay. I'm going to pull the audience. Give me a, let's do the number seven. If you have ever used a prescription food diet or your pet's on a prescription food diet and you're terrified either of the ingredients or of coming off of it because you're like, it seems like it's gotten my pet to a place where they're in a good state now. So drop a seven if you res if you resonate with Jan's question for her older kitty cat that's been on a prescription food for seven years now. Okay, here's the thing. Prescription food diets are not meant to be used for life. They have no long-term research with them. The, the research that's done when we're doing food trials are typically for no longer than six months. So how do we know that these prescription diets are not creating more of a health issue long-term if we're not actually testing it? They are meant for short-term use and they can benefit pets tremendously. Um, I don't use them because there's other ways to approach health using food therapy, using herbs, following the foundations and principles that I talk about and teach in all of our programs and master classes um, that we've been sharing links to. Here's the thing, it can be really scary when we go through that experience and spend a lot of money and then all of a sudden now we're seeing our pets doing better. So I don't know if she's still having like licking fur off. Here's the thing. I always go back to the foundations and principles. So with that food, the food change may not be the first thing, right? Especially when we're a bit weary of going back to other, other things. I would be looking at, do we have a gut health issue? So that we have a lot of great functional medicine tests from Innovative Pet Lab to see, do we have leaky gut? Is the immune system working the way it's supposed to? Is digestion working? animal biome to see, do we have a dysbiosis? A lot of times these animals do, and it's lying dormant. So we may not see physical outward symptoms at this point, but what's happening is, is we're all on this spectrum of health where we have symptoms down here and we have optimal health here, and we're constantly moving along this spectrum. And the closer we get to here, then all of a sudden what happens is the body's like, I've had enough, I can't handle it. And it breaks and we see symptoms. And usually that's when we diagnose something. We don't want to get to this place. So I see a lot of, and work with a lot of pet parents where they're like, my vet's saying they don't know, they can't figure it out, right? They couldn't find CSU, couldn't figure out what she was allergic to. So the immune system's doing something, right? It doesn't mean we're in a state of health. We're somewhere around here. So we need to get back to the state of health before the body breaks, before we fall off of that cliff. And now we're, we need that ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. And that's what conventional medicine is doing. And there's a time and a place for that. So what we need to do is make sure we're ruling out certain things that were creating resistance or causing the symptoms that led to Jan's cat experiencing those allergies. So we need to take that step back and assess, is there an emotional health stress issue? I have cats. I have three cats. Adding a third cat in created a lot more stress. We weren't planning on it, a third cat. I was like, I just think two is great. And then we got a third. So here's the thing. They are very emotional beings. So are dogs, but cats are very sensitive to their environments. They are very intuitive. They're very sensitive to us. My cats are my teachers. They have taught me so much about grounding myself and creating more emotional resilience. So I don't upset them and create health issues. So I'd be looking at, are there some, is there something going on here? That's actually that gut brain connection that's then leading to leaky gut. There's so many great tools we have to support cats. One of the really awesome ways to support them is using herb gardens. So my amazing friend, uh, Julianne Thorne with Naturally Cats, she's actually hosting a free conference this weekend. Check it out. I will drop the link once this goes live so you can check that out. If you don't have your free ticket, get your free ticket because you're going to learn about, if you have a cat, you need to be there because you're going to learn from all different types of colleagues um, and different ways to support your cat from emotional health techniques to integrating holistic remedies. And Jay and Adrian and my other great friends, the two crazy cat ladies will be there too along with Karen Dundee Smith talking about energy, essential oils, herbs, selection, uh, self-selection, but putting an herb garden down using dried organic herbs is a game changer. 
especially if you have a multi-cat household, because there will be some element of stress. And if they're over grooming because of stress, your immunosuppressants are going to make that worse because we're not treating the actual root cause. So that's really important, especially with cats, as we're looking at the emotional health side and the environmental side. A lot of these cats too, think about a cat and a dog. They're constantly grooming, like naturally, not over grooming, hopefully, but they're going to be grooming toxins, chemicals, things like that also off of their bodies. So detoxification is really important also. So this is also where like hair tissue mineral analysis tests are really helpful too. So if you have a pet that is doing these types of behaviors, are they actually getting the toxins they're exposed to? And here's the other kind of news flash is that you can have as clean of a household. I'm talking about natural clean, not using, if you're using Clorox bleach, you're using uh, your art, like your Tide detergents, like change that because that's Tide stays with you for like six weeks. That's how strong it is. But we can, even if you're using natural cleaners, we still live in a toxic world. Your pets can be born with it. It can come from the food. It can come from the water. It's not meant to scare you because when we open those detox pathways, we can handle a lot of things. Our bodies innately are incredible and so are our pets, but it helps to know if that's a layer. This is a layer that's just staying stuck there because you could change the food. And if we haven't addressed the toxins in detox, this cat might react poorly to the diet change. So that's where some of these tests are very powerful and helpful. If you can do them, if you can't, you still follow those foundations and those frameworks because we still need to heal them. It's really, really important. So I hope that helps. Now, I just wanted to round out this coffee talk with a couple high level points because I know a lot of pet parents are dealing with this. Let me know in the comments if you found this helpful, if you feel like this would be something that would be helpful uh, to do more routinely with uh, submitting questions and going through how I would approach this. So drop me a yes or drop me a no. Either way, it's helpful feedback and information for me as we move forward um, because we've got a whole year together with our coffee talks. Uh, oh, thanks, Nosley. Yes. Awesome. And if it didn't, that's okay. I love feedback. Feedback, positive and negative is helpful. There's always something in that. But keep in mind, if this is you or you're looking at a pro, hopefully proactive approach, these principles apply. Remember to take that step back. Don't just focus on the tree. The tree is like the symptom or the like IBD diagnosis. Step and that are going to help us to figure out what's going on. And that's where using, we have so many free resources. Our Better Gut Health Masterclass covers a lot of that. If you want to go deeper, our Better Gut Health program that's self-paced. And if you want the, the top of the pinnacle of everything, working really closely with me, being surrounded by other like-minded pet parents, and learn how to use food therapy and herbs, integrate that true holistic approach to make sure we're not missing something, schedule a call. You know, I work, we have about 10 slots total each month for pet parents, but we have to make sure it works for you and what you're looking for and what you need for your pets. That's why I do them because it's not a fit for everyone. But as you can see with a lot of our members that are here commenting, it can be a game changer and a life changer to have the support and guidance through our lifetime program so that you can come in and out as often as you need to understand why your pet may be experiencing those symptoms and to start figuring out that root cause, but have support, guidance, and mentorship along that journey. Because when we have a mentor and guide, we can find those underlying issues and we can heal much faster than doing it all on our own. I've been there. It's been over a decade. And having mentors and guides along the way speeds up that process. And being amongst like-minded people is key. This side of medicine is hard because not everyone agrees with what we do and that's okay. But being around other people that support you and lift you up, that is the healing environment that you need to help figure it out. So if you need the help and guidance, schedule a call. If not, 
check out all our free content at The Natural Pet Doctor. And there'll be more and we'll do more of these. It sounded like it was really helpful. So thank you for everyone commenting. If you need more guidance, go to the naturalpetdoctor.com. If you're not certain about something, send us an email to the info at the naturalpetdoctor.com. Sometimes we can't give specifics because we're not managing your pet's care, but we do our best to try to find resources and tools to help you. But I appreciate each and every one of you showing up, taking time out of your day. You are why I do what I do. I truly appreciate everything you do for your pets and your drive to learn more and do better for your pets. We are all on this journey together. We're just at different parts of our path. So I look forward to seeing you next week on our next Coffee Talk with the Doc. I'm Dr. Katie Woodley, the natural pet doctor. Take care.